The Lord be with you. Thank you, Linnell, for that. And we continue to pray for Pat as he is uh, still in some pain today, but we continue to lift him up and trust that uh, he'll be back with us soon. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to Mark chapter 7. You'll see there uh, in the bulletin, there's a sort of a, a selection of verses from there, but I think we'll just read all the way through them. We won't uh, skip the stuff the lectionary skips, so uh, it may not be up on the, the screen there, but if you have your Bible with you, we'll be reading uh, chapter 7, uh, verses 1 through 23, which sounds long, but we'll make it through, I promise. Mark chapter 7, beginning with verse 1. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders, and they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, The people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever speaks evil of father or mother must surely die. But you say that if anyone tells father or mother, whatever support you might have from me is Corban, that is an offering to God, then you no longer permit doing anything for a father or mother, thus making void the word of God through your tradition that you have handed on, and you do many things like this. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile but the things that come out are what defile. When he left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about the parable. He said to them, Then do you also fail to understand? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile, since it enters not the heart but the stomach and goes out into the sewer? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, Is it not what comes out of a person that defiles? For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come, fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O oh God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, help us to hear through these words of Scripture what you would have us to hear. Your words, not mine. May we hear your words calling us to be transformed, Lord. To be transformed more into the likeness of your Son, Jesus, who calls us ever on. And in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, you'll see one in every restaurant restroom or in just about every gas station with a public toilet. Sometimes, usually depending on the quality of the place, uh, it might be in a nice uh, frame, an installed piece, maybe a placard ordered from a factory, clearly identifiable, clearly legible, spelled correctly. Sometimes it just might be a sheet of notebook paper, scotch tape to the mirror. But whatever the case may be, by law, public restrooms are required to post a sign that says something like, Employees must wash hands. My favorite response to this, by the way, was a guy on the internet who said, You know, I sat there forever and no employee ever came in and washed my hands. I suppose these signs are posted there to make us at least feel better about the potential cleanliness of those who are handling our food, those who are touching our groceries or whatever snacks or trinkets we happen to pick up 
at the convenience store. Of course, it goes without saying, or at least it should go without saying, that we want people to wash their hands. We want to wash our hands before handling food, before sharing a meal, before performing open heart surgery, or maybe even before we go into the hospital room to visit a loved one. Why? Well, because a man, a French biologist named Louis Pasteur, confirmed what was then known as the germ theory with his experiments in the late 1800s, proving that infection, disease, and fermentation even were in fact not caused by the air around us, but by the things in the air, and maybe even more so the, the organisms that live on the surface of things. And so, ever since then, we wash our hands, most of us, to cleanse as many of these potentially harmful disease-carrying germs as possible. We wash our hands to prevent sickness. But these Pharisees and scribes in our text this morning aren't complaining about Jesus' disciples because they've lacked the unsanitary or the, the sanitary knowledge to use Germex to wash their hands. No folks back in Jesus' day had no idea that disease and illness could be spread by not washing your hands. So they're not complaining about that. These Pharisees and scribes are complaining because some of Jesus' disciples, well, they're not keeping with tradition. They aren't being so-called good Jews. You see, there's no law, no law in the Hebrew Bible commanding that all the people must wash their hands before they eat. Though, honestly, I think it wouldn't have been a bad one for Moses to put in there. But there is a law requiring that the priests have to wash their hands and their feet before ministering at the altar of God and presumably before eating their portion of the sacrifice. You can find that law in Exodus 30. So the priests had to wash their hands, but here again it's not about hygiene. They're not washing their hands to, to be clean from germs and bacteria. It's about sanctimony about the ceremonial preparation of the priests before they carried out their religious work. Therefore, clean hands in Jesus' day were understood to be more religiously clean, prepared to honor God more than prepared to prevent disease. So the Pharisees and scribes in Jesus' day took many of these requirements by the priests seriously and believed that God had in fact called all of Israel to be, as it also says in Exodus, a priestly kingdom. And therefore, all the faithful, the Pharisees especially, believed that all the faithful of Israel should adhere to the requirements of the traditions of the elders and the priests. So when these Pharisees and scribes, who have been watching Jesus and his followers closely, hoping to find some point of incongruency, some thing about which to complain... When these scribes and elders witness some of Jesus' disciples eating with, the NRSV says, defiled hands, which really is just a way to say common hands, that is not sanctified hands, they are quick to move on the opportunity to reveal Jesus for the lax leader he is. After all, if these good Jewish disciples of this good Jewish rabbi aren't washing their hands before a meal, how righteous could they be? I mean, if they weren't wearing their WWJD bracelet, if they didn't have their Bible tucked under their arm, their, ear off of their, their hair off of their ears and their shirt tails tucked in, how righteous could they be? And so they asked Jesus, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Did you notice they give away their intention by the very way they asked the question? Why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders? Tradition. Now, traditions are fine things in and of themselves. Objectively, a tradition can be a wonderful thing, something that can unite a group of people, giving them a sense of shared identity. I've been a part of more than one of those traditions in my life. When I was in high school, before the tornado came in 2007 and, and, and wiped out our high school, there was a, a five or six foot circle of, of tile, just pale white and pale blue tile, 
in the first hall of the high school. In 1965, the graduating class donated this tiled wildcat in the middle of the hall. And even when there were eight or nine hundred of us in that building, you could see it. It was like Moses parting the Red Sea, just a big void in the hall. Because the tradition was, you don't step on the wildcat. And as the story went, if you did step on the wildcat, you had to stay after class and clean it with your own toothbrush. At Samford, there was the tradition of lighting the way and hanging of the green around Christmas time. When I was a senior, I was invited to be a part of that worship service. Very traditional, everyone played their part. I lit a candle in the window somewhere over there in Reed Chapel. Then there are those less serious traditions, really almost sort of silly traditions. Every year at Christmas, my dad gets a cheap ink pen and a pair of Dollar Tree sunglasses from my stepsister, who then in turn get a, gets a can of Coke and a jar of peanut butter from my dad. I have no idea where this came from, and I don't know why they keep doing it, but they do. Sure, traditions are fine things in and of themselves. But here's the thing. When traditions become litmus tests for who's deserving and who isn't, when they become the way one measures the value of another individual, when traditions become lines drawn, walls built, qualifications enforced, keeping them separate from us, then traditions have to be called out for what they really are. Hypocritical sin. That's what Jesus calls it. Jesus does just that with these traditions that these Pharisees and scribes are holding over his disciples. When he quotes from the prophet Isaiah, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. And then he says to them, You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. What these Pharisees have done is place more importance on the practice itself rather than choosing to focus on the purpose of the practice. In other words, a practice that was meant to testify to the holiness of God. Priests wash their hands and their feet as a way of showing that this is God who is holy. Rather than focusing on what it's meant to focus on, to the importance of recognizing the source of one's sustenance, it became a practice of piety. A measuring stick used to tell how much more righteous you are than somebody else. I mean, I can hear these sorts of folks, right? Oh, sure, you might pray over your chips and salsa, but I wash my hand in the tradition of the elders and the priests, which means you know that I love God more than you do. Can't you hear it? Can't you hear how traditions, rituals, religious practices can suddenly transform from acts meant to remind us of who we are and who God is into works of self-righteousness wielded as weapons of delineation and division? Can't you hear it? Can't you hear how such warped traditions and beliefs can reveal the hypocrisy at the heart of those who seek to hold others to them? I remember talking to Ted one Sunday morning before worship. Ted's family was, was pretty strong in our little church. In fact, most of the people who were there on a Sunday morning were related to Ted in one way or another. Probably twice, actually. Some of you understand what I'm talking about. I was talking to Ted because I had noticed his recent absence from Sunday school I wanted to be sure nothing was wrong, uh, that nothing bad had happened, that he wasn't in conflict with somebody in the class. And so I walked over to him and said, Ted, haven't seen you in Sunday school in a while. Everything okay? He sort of grimaced and said, well, Chris, here's the thing. A few years ago, I tried to come to church every time we had service. I'd be here for Sunday school, for worship. I even came on Sunday nights. I came on Wednesday night prayer meeting. But then they changed our schedule at work. We didn't work five days a week. Now we're working four and cramming more time. And so I didn't get off in time to be here for a Wednesday night prayer meeting. So when I'd come to Sunday school, the first thing, first thing they'd say to me is, Ted, where were you at Wednesday night? 
He said that went on for a few weeks. Well, then my son and daughter-in-law moved out of town. And the only time we could see our grandkids well, it was on Sunday afternoon. So uh, there were a few Sunday afternoons where we'd spend time with the grandkids and we'd miss church because we were traveling home. And I'd get to Sunday school. Where were you at Sunday night? Every time I walked through the door. So I just gave up going to Sunday school. Because everyone wanted to know, where was I at for this? Where was I at for that? Nobody ever said to me, Ted, we're glad you're here right now. Everyone wanted to know why I wasn't coming to those other services. Like it made me some kind of a lesser Christian. And then he said this to me. He said, they don't get that just showing up for another church service doesn't make you a better Christian, do they? All I could say was, no, Ted. No, they don't. Because you see, all that stuff, all that stuff is just surface level. It's window dressing. Yeah, come to church. Yes, read your Bible. Yes, say your prayers. Do all of those things that draw you closer to God and to one another. But beware, when practicing your own piety, that you do not give in to the temptation to judge others who aren't living as holy as you. Beware that you do not give in to the temptation to think of others as less than you because you've been to church more than they have in the past six months than, than they have or because you know your psalms from your proverbs or because you don't say the words they say or because you don't watch the shows they watch because you don't drink the things they drink because you don't hang out with the folks they hang out with because you've already made up your mind on things that they're still trying to figure out. You see, that temptation... To look at others and go, at least I don't do what they do. That temptation leads to believing that somehow, somehow you are better than they are. That somehow you are actually more deserving of God's forgiveness, of God's grace, more deserving of God's love. And that was the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and scribes. They weren't concerned for Jesus' disciples. They weren't going around looking under their fingernails. You miss some dirt. It's going, to, it's going to get in your food. It's going to, no. They pointed out their ritualistic infraction because these Pharisees and scribes wanted to show just how much holier they were than Jesus. How much holier they were than his disciples. How much more right they were in their convictions, in their practices, in their ways of living. This is why Jesus addresses the crowd and in a sort of over speaking to the Pharisees and all of us who may be tempted to think we are better than someone else. Jesus says, listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile. But the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, which is a $5 word for greed, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. Do you know what I'm tempted to do when I read that list? Probably the same thing you are. Find the one I don't do and find out who does. You laugh because I'm right. I'm right. Find out what I don't do and who does it, and then I can say, at least I don't do that. At least I don't do that. I heard a man one time say, you know what the definition of sin is, don't you? Whatever you do that I don't. Jesus says all these evil things, even the ones you do, do. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. In other words, Jesus says it isn't all about holy, holy pretenses. It isn't all about surface-level righteousness that we try to pass off as being, quote, good Christians. It isn't about eating the right things, attending the right services, reading the right versions of the Bible, sharing the right posts on Facebook, or making sure that everyone knows what side of the line you're on in order to cause a fuss. It's about what comes out of who you are. What comes from your heart. Because you see, friends, I've learned we can try to cover over selfishness with all kinds of pretty words and prescribed actions, but that selfishness always finds its way out. 
You can try to ignore your own sinfulness by pointing out the sin in somebody else. But that sinfulness is still there. You can look at someone else's dirty hands and feel better about your own dirty heart. But it won't change a thing. And that's something I know I need to hear. But I think a lot of us do. Because it's so easy, so easy to see the sin in someone else and excuse our own. I think Jesus said something about that somewhere else, didn't he? So easy to see the speck in someone else's eye and ignore that big old two before coming out of ours. It's easy to look at someone else's life, their misdeeds, their mistakes, their failures, their faults, and all the way that they fall short of our own personal piety and use our own sense of self-righteousness to keep them away. Away from us and away from God. No, 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 your hands aren't clean. You can't sit at this table. No, 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 you haven't kept with the traditions of the... You can't sit with us. No, no, you're not wearing the right clothes. No, you're not reading the right way. You're not doing the right things. You are not welcome here until... until you obey our traditions. Until you get in line with the way we think. That's how the sin comes out. How our sin comes out. Whenever we think we are better than someone, more deserving than someone, better than anyone in the eyes of God, that's when we expose our sin to the world. Because you see, following Jesus isn't about keeping a check on others. It isn't about scouring the scriptures in search for the greater moral failures of others that we may feel better about than our own seemingly lesser failures. It isn't about separating ourselves from those we have decided are defiled, unclean, or unworthy. Because following Jesus is about realizing that we are all, every single one of us, without exception, sinners stained by our own selfishness, and that none of us is better deserving than anyone else. That none of us is better or more deserving of God's love than the next person. Following Jesus is about seeing others as Christ sees them. As Christ sees us. Following Jesus is about choosing to love them As Christ loves them. As Christ loves us. No matter how defiled our hands. No matter what traditions they follow or don't. No matter how unclean our very own hearts are. No matter what goes into our stomachs or comes out of our mouths. Because the truth is, God loves them anyway. And the real truth that I think we have a hard time with is that God loves us anyway. Christ loves us anyway. No matter how dirty our hands, no matter what goes in, no matter what comes out, Christ loves us anyway. And so let us love as God in Christ loves us and everyone else. Would you pray with me? Eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Lord, we come to you now knowing that our hands are not clean. But Lord, we come knowing all the more that neither are our hearts. So Lord, we turn them over to you, not only now, but with every breath. Every time our actions betray our desires. Every time when we want to follow you and yet we give in a little bit more to ourselves. God, help us. Help us, Lord, when the temptation to draw a line and to put 
them over there and us over here. Help us, God, not to draw such lines. But to realize that not a single one of us is more deserving of your love than the next. And that, Lord, that's what grace is, isn't it? So remind us of that, Lord. Stir in our hearts even now, reminding us of your great love for us and everyone else. And by your Holy Spirit, grant us the strength, Lord, to change whatever within us needs to change so that there is less of us and more of you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.